So, welcome everyone. Uh, but we've done pretty well at uh, filling, half filling this uh, screen on a Friday morning, and um, the first of our uh, series of talks and discussion um, that we'll be holding over the coming months. So, some basic housekeeping. We have got a camera um, at the back of the room, and we will be filming the event. <laughs> So for um, anyone who doesn't want to be included in the film, please see me or um, Martin at the end and we can edit out. Um, but hopefully we'll have a great record of this event, something that we can share with other rebels who are able to come on a Friday morning. And also what will undoubtedly be put up on to YouTube for uh, more people to see how this discussion unfolds. Um, if a fire alarm goes off, I've been told it's not planned. Um, I've also been told it might just be a pre-alarm, um, so we'll wait until someone comes to let us know. But if it seems like pretty urgent, I guess we should get out, and those are the, um, those are the exits. Um, we'll be having a break at half time. Um, so it'll be a short break, probably not enough time to get coffee, but enough time to go to the toilet and just stretch legs, so about 10 minutes. Um, toilets are just out and around the corner. Okay, so that's the housekeeping. Um, so, this is the first of a series of discussions that we're going to be holding in Sheffield. Uh, we were going to hopefully have another one this year, but the elections got in the way, and we're doing so many things around it, but we're going to be putting that into the new year now. Um, the title of the discussions will be Vision and Strategy. So vision, I think we can feel fairly confident about. We have an idea of a world which is going to be different. It's going to be better, kinder, gentler, and certainly one which lives within the planetary limits. I, don't, I feel we're, we're confident of coming together to, with that vision. The issue is, in order to get there, we have to create that world. And in creating that world, we have um, strategies. Uh, and some of those strategies involve discussion. And it's clear that those discussions at times um, can feel difficult. They can feel uncomfortable. Sometimes they feel like they're being divisive. They're ta taking people apart. But what we want to do is try and understand, reflect, share, and come to inhabit um, the ideas and concepts. So what are those issues that have emerged just slightly before the rebellion and certainly during the October rebellion? I think um, in Sheffield it came up in the form of the notion of anti-capitalism. What does it mean to be anti-capitalist? Um, another term which came up in London was um, decolonize XR. And we're also now starting to talk much wider about things like just transitions and social justice. So when we're putting a climate emergency at the forefront, how do we relate to issues of marginality, um, austerity? So it's some of those things that we're going to be looking at in this series of discussions. And in many respects, it might feel that it's easier to ignore these things, things which, uh, which seem like divisive, things which can even seem like politics. Maybe using that term beyond politics offers us a cover, some hope for the messiness, uh, and hoping it will go away. But it doesn't go away. We can't ignore it, because what we're doing when we act, we're acting in the context of a socio-economic system with its well-developed belief systems, and with actors who don't always respond in the way in which we have intended or what we expected. And I think there's no clearer example of that than in London with the um, Canning Town tube action. So that idea of strategy and action really came to be quite significant in that event. Um, so in order for us to be able to outreach effectively, we need to address these issues. And I feel if today this is far more true than any time uh, in my lifetime as an activist, where post-truth makes our message not only difficult to convey, but generates emotional responses that threaten what we're trying to do. And we only need to look at the star on a Friday morning 
to understand how those emotional responses rub up against uh, our attempts to be factual, to use science, to use reasoning and logic, it just evaporates with um, some of the statements which come back to us. Um, we need to feel comfortable inhabiting this space. As I said, we're, we're talking about strategy and theory, even politics, and uh, we need to go at a pace which is manageable. We need to use all of our principles as, as XR, um, principles of respect, principles of not calling out, not naming, not shaming, but so that we can all feel comfortable in moving in a direction towards some understanding so that as we go onto these actions that we can underpin them um, with, with, with knowledge. Um, we've already started to embark on some of that um, in XR Sheffield locally and I think what we'll be seeing is the kind of actions that we've, we've begun on in the last few months will become much more important nationally. So for example with the Doncaster floods where we um, reached out, we were, we were slow off the mark to be a photo shoot, but we were really quick at identifying the significance of um, reaching out to marginal and to vulnerable communities. And our, our efforts there were, were appreciated and it allowed us to start building um, a base uh, amongst people we haven't necessarily had um, a base with previously. We're also doing maybe the thing which uh, was raised on Monday where we supported um, Ivan Diniz and his um, Corrado uh, rainforest projects in Brazil and raised a fantastic £145 and have started to build some kind of communication and outreach with people working in the global south. Um, our tentative steps into working um, in the Muslim community in Sheffield through the mosques and also through um, the taxi drivers of Burngreave. Um, and I think some of the things which will come up later, we'll be able to look at more of those issues that we've been involved with. So the purpose of these talks really is to put all of that into some kind of theoretical context, theory in a singular form, or maybe combining theories, plural, a plural plurality of theory. Um, and the benefit will hopefully make us more aware of the pace of the, that the climate emergency is acting, open us to the needs of the marginal who are being impacted the most, whether it's here in the UK or in the global south, and make us much more accepting of one another and the differences that we bring to this movement of Extinction Rebellion. So, that's enough of that. Um, that introduces the series. It will continue in... Um, the new year. It's not all necessarily just going to be a theory, it's going to be open discussions on all sorts of issues, but the beginning of is the strategy um, approach. Now I want to introduce our introductory speaker, who's Rupert Reed. I'm really grateful that Rupert agreed to be here today. He's really bent the stick to get here. He was going to be speaking in Leeds, but he hasn't let us down. He's come regardless. Um, and that's brilliant. Uh, Rupert's an important spokesman for Extinction Rebellion. I'm sure loads of you will have seen him on television on many occasions. But he's also a really important communicator and important speaker. He's the Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of East Anglia. He chaired the Greenhouse Think Tank, a former Green Party councillor, Green Party member, and almost a Green Party MEP. So he's going to kick off this series of talks with a discussion of what should XR strategy be moving forward. Following that discussion, we'll have a, a Q&A session and then break for about 10 minutes or so. And then Emma is going to introduce um, some findings from our debrief session at the Friends Meeting House uh, several weeks ago. And I think we then have a Q&A that will follow that, and we'll start to see probably more of how the local things that we've been doing and some of the ideas that Rupert is introducing, uh, how they're meshing together. Um, 
at the end, Rupert will conclude very briefly, and then we'll finish, and hopefully many of us will be able to uh, head off up to the Town Hall and join the Youth Strike for Climate. It's an, a really important international youth strike today. It was on the Radio 4 programme this morning, um, and Rupert's going to be there speaking in Sheffield for the Town Hall before going hand. So without further words, can we give a very jazzy hand welcome to Rupert Reid. Thanks, that's a lovely introduction, Si. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here in, uh, in Sheffield. Um, uh, it's such a healthy, big local group, that's great. I'm not 100% healthy myself, um, but I didn't want to let you all down, so I'm looking forward to this very much. So, let me start out by reminding you just very, very briefly uh, why we are here. And we're here because the situation is truly desperate. I don't know how many of you saw the latest thing in Nature, the world's most prominent uh, scientific journal, by basically the world's most prominent climate scientist this week, a commentary suggesting that there is evidence that, uh, that elements of irreversible uh, anthropogenic climate change may have uh, begun. Uh, there is evidence that the ice sheet melt uh, in the Antarctic and Greenland is irreversible uh, and that uh, these tipping points have now been triggered uh, and that the only question is uh, uh, how quickly or slowly um, we, uh, they will progress. So it's because of things like that, right, that we're here, that the situation is desperate. As I often say, um, if you're not uh, terrified, you're not paying attention. Uh, and that the situation is, uh, is, is full of sadness and full of grief and often we're full of rage. All of this, of course, comes really from love. We're here because we love each other and we love our children and we love this beautiful world. And we're absolutely determined to do what is necessary to take care of it even though the situation is, as I say, potentially now one where there are limits as to, as to what we can actually do. We are committed to various kinds of terrible damage to the world and, and to our future. We are committed to that as a species um, by what we've already done, which just underscores the extent to which we have to be committed to doing everything that we have to be committed to doing everything we can to arrest that or at least slow it down. So it's in that context of, of awful uh, truth-telling which liberates us, yeah? Because once you realise that our, government has, our governments have put us on a track to this kind of catastrophic future, then as we say in the Declaration of Rebellion, well, how can their laws mean anything much to us anymore? So we're, we're freed now to do what we need to do in response to that. It's in that context, it's in the context of telling the truth about that, that we find ourselves thinking, all right, so what are we going to do? What is the best way to deal with this unthinkably horrendous situation? Which only, it's not obvious to everybody that's like that, only because of the time lags that there are in the system. If everybody could see the ice sheet melt that we're already committed to, you know, could see the sea level rise that is already bound to happen. If that was already, you know, if, if, if there was some kind of machine that could take you into the future and, and, and show you that, like, like on a film, yeah, this is what it will be like at minimum in terms of badness by, say, 2050, 2100. If everybody could see that, it would be easier for action, the right kind of action to occur. But there are these big time lags and the feedbacks and the tipping points happen slowly. So we have to act uh, ahead of that, and, and that's our challenge. We are uh, in the, the, the vanguard in that sense. And in that sense, of course, we're also in the vanguard in terms of the, the, the pain uh, of it. Uh, many of you, like me probably, um, have suffered um, excruciatingly sometimes, uh, mentally or in your dreams. Um, you know, many of us have suffered uh, from um, elements of, uh, of depression, despair, eco-anxiety, etc. We are, of course, the lucky ones. Yeah? We're the lucky ones because we're experiencing that now. Whereas for everybody else, as these things start to unfold, they're going to be hit by it more uh, later 
as it actually happens. They're not going to be prepared. We're going to be prepared. So we're, we're the lucky ones. So if you're, if you're suffering mentally from what's going on, you're one of the lucky ones. And we're also, we're also lucky because that suffering is itself part of our awakening, right? So it's rational to feel sad. It's rational to feel grief-stricken. It's rational to feel terrified. If you're not terrified, you're not paying attention. And, that, and those emotions can empower us to do the right thing, right? And that's, again, part of what Extinction Rebellion is, right? We feel these emotions, and spokespeople like me try to uh, express them as well. Uh, and then it empowers us to rise up and, and do the right thing. And that's what we are, and that's what we're doing. So the climate change debate last night on Channel 4, I imagine nearly everybody here saw it. If you didn't, you, you definitely must. First thing about that, remember, we achieved that, right? That almost certainly wouldn't have happened at all were it not for the huge change in the mood in this country due to Extinction Rebellion this year, plus, of course, the climate school strikers. So, you know, that's great. That's one among many examples of how things are completely different now from how they were uh, a year ago. And that's because of us. That's especially, I would suggest, because of April, because of the success of April, which I'll say more about in a moment. But in general, it's also due to the, the change in atmosphere that we've brought about. I thought the most powerful part of the whole program, actually, apart from the brilliant um, dripping ice sculptures, which just, I, I just, I couldn't believe they had the chutzpah to actually do that. It's so, so good. It, 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 when I actually saw them, I thought, oh my God, they've actually done it. I just didn't believe they'd do it. I thought the most powerful part of the whole program was the little two-minute thing that uh, Channel 4 themselves put together at the start, that film, right? And I've see, seen quite a few uh, heads nodding. Um, and that was powerful because it was triggering those kinds of emotions which I mentioned uh, a moment ago. And I felt that some of that was missing from the, the leaders' debate itself, right? They plunged straight into solutionizing uh, and there was very, very little room for any emotionality in their discourse or their way of handling the thing, which I thought was a little uh, disappointing. So we need to keep bringing that. Yeah. So as I say, there, that's a classic example, a, a wonderful contemporary example of how we've changed everything uh, this year. But as Sai's been implying, when we look at how things have gone for XR over this first year of our existence, I think there is a fairly clear distinction between April and October. And, and the distinction is roughly this. In October, we followed a, a strategy and it worked. Uh, and we changed opinion in this country. The opinion polls are very clear about that. And we got to meet with the government and, we got, and the parliament voted through a climate and environment emergency and so on and so forth. And we got somewhere one first tentative step towards truth telling being instituted in this country. In October, we tried the same again, basically, uh, on a larger scale. And we didn't really get much more traction. Uh, and I think we have to be honest with ourselves uh, about this, um, that I think that when you compare April and October, it's a fairly clear contrast, really. April was a huge success. October was not. I'm not saying that October didn't achieve anything. October was heroic in all sorts of ways. October gave us some opportunity for some new great uh, media coverage and um, various good things happened. And we did some new things as well, and I'll talk about one or two of those things. But I think, to put not too fine a point on it, I think we can't really go on like this. I think the idea that we could just have another bigger gathering in the spring, which is the idea which a lot of people are operating according to, is not viable uh, for two reasons, really. Firstly, I think it won't be much bigger, I think is the honest truth. I think that we've, we've reached kind of the limits of this current organizing and momentum-driven model. And secondly, even if it was bigger, unless it was a lot, lot, lot bigger, I don't think it would really um, help very much. Uh, I think we've reached the limits of what we can achieve by just doing things like turning up in large numbers and blocking roads. Um, if there were hundreds of thousands of us willing to uh, potentially be arrested, 
if we could literally bring London to a halt completely, that would be different. And maybe we'll get there at some point. Because then we would be at the same kind of point that people reached in, say, the people power uh, revolution in the Philippines, when you literally can just say to the police, well, it's, it's obviously pointless for you to try to, to, uh, uh, to organize what we're doing because we're just incalculably larger than you are. But I think we're a long way from that point of having hundreds of thousands of people ready to take that kind of action. So I think we have to change up and be smarter. <clears throat> so let's take a moment to look at one or two of the things in the uh, October Rebellion which did seem relatively uh, successful. So one of them I would suggest was the um, occupation of uh, London City Airport. It wasn't completely successful. Um, it might have been more successful if there'd been more planning for it. If we hadn't been, I would argue, somewhat distracted by the thought of maybe targeting uh, Heathrow during previous months and the whole divisiveness around that and around the possible use of drones, which I think was not a very good idea because the great strength of XR comes from our vulnerability and our sacrifice, our willing to, willingness to put our bodies, ourselves on the line. And once, you, once you use drones, you've kind, of, you've kind of distracted everybody from that and you've got these kind of metallic little technological devices which are associated in people's minds with unpleasant things and, and don't bring to mind simply ordinary people with their, with their bodies putting themselves on the line. But London City Airport was, within the confines of a relatively short time to organise it, I think a pretty successful um, uh, action. One reason it was successful, I would suggest, is that London City Airport is well known as an airport which is used disproportionately by business people and by people who are uh, from the wealthier end of the spectrum, as all airports are, but London City Airport more so. One reason for that is because London City Airport has a short runway, so the planes are all smaller, so they're all more polluting and, um, and there's a lot of private jets there and so forth. And then on the Monday of the second week when we went to the City of London, that also seemed quite um, successful. Um, and that may have triggered the, uh, the change in police tactics uh, on the Tuesday when they decided to shut down the whole of XR, which gave us an enormous uh, boost because suddenly simply, being, simply wearing a badge like this, um, you know, I heard police uh, coming, to pe coming up to people in Trafalgar Square and saying, you're with XR, we'll arrest you if you stay here. Um, so assembly, simply assembling became um, allegedly uh, illegal. And that put a huge weight of public opinion onto our side. It was exactly the kind of overreaction from the authorities we'd been looking to uh, provoke. Um, and of course, the courts have since ruled uh, uh, in our favor and, and hundreds of rebels uh, are now um, getting their, uh, uh, their charges dropped because of, uh, because of that illegal, as it turns out, uh, police action of attempting to shut down XR uh, completely. Unfortunately, we then lost the momentum from that because of the uh, tube action going ahead on the Thursday uh, of that week. I would argue at, at the worst possible time because at a time when simply you know, being there with other people from XR and wearing a badge or something was illegal, it was unnecessary to sort of do the kind of anti-upping of a very severe nature that was involved in the tube action, um, uh, disrupting public transport and so on and so forth. So what lessons can we draw from this? Well, it seems to me that the lesson is a, is a, is a very, very straightforward one, really. Uh, and it's implicit in my uh, pamphlet, Truth and Its Consequences, which some of you will have read and uh, that I wrote this summer. And I think it's still um, uh, worth reading uh, as much now uh, as ever. And it's on that uh, pamphlet that I've built in the, um, in the uh, little document that uh, Sai has sent around uh, to you all that was proposed background reading for today. If you didn't get to read that, then Sai was Sai's gonna send it around again um, after today, and I would urge you to, to read it. I think you may find it useful. And the, at the heart of my argument uh, in that pamphlet and in that uh, document is that XR needs to shift from doing actions which are perceived as targeting ordinary people and the, the large bulk of the population to actions that are perceived much more as targeting those who are actually responsible for the problem, uh, the rich, the powerful, uh, the elites, uh, the large uh, corporations, um, the, the governors. Um, uh, and we've made the point completely that, yes, we're all in this together in some sense and that everybody is going to have to change. What we haven't done is made the point successfully that some are going to have to change a lot more than others. 
uh, and that we do need a, a just transition and that in that just transition, ordinary working people are going to be uh, needing to change their lives a lot less uh, than the rich and wealthy and, and powerful. And that simple shift, I think, could give us enormous new power. And what are the implications of it? Well, the implications of it would be things like, let's do a lot more stuff in the city and let's target London City Airport uh, again, or maybe uh, the private jets uh, spaces at, uh, at, at airports and other airports that are up for um, uh, uh, expansion, um, but especially uh, those elements of them which are used by the, uh, by the rich and the polluter elite, such as, um, such as uh, private jets. Um, let's do a lot more of that kind of action. Let's definitely not do actions which target public transport. And by the way, of course, that really includes um, buses. So it means you have to be very careful about blocking roads. So why are we spending so much time blocking roads? Why aren't we doing more actions that target the polluter elite? Why aren't we doing more actions that target the, the corporations that um, in many ways control our lives and control the government? And I believe if we made this kind of shift, we could start to get into a situation where we have more public opinion coming behind us um, and do not experience the frustrations that I think we experienced um, in October. Now, some might respond to this by saying, yes, but we don't really need public opinion behind us, do we? We only need 3.5% um, of the population or something like that. Uh, so a couple of things about that, just briefly. I, I go into this more in the, in the document that, uh, that's been sent around to you. Uh, one point about that, which is quite crucial, is that this 3.5% figure, you need to be very, very careful with it. Um, don't confuse causation with correlation, right? What do I mean by that? So, yes, uh, Erica Chenoweth and others have uh, allegedly shown that successful uh, revolutionary uh, movements and nonviolent direct action movements succeed if they get about 3.5% of the population actively on their side. But they never aimed for that, right? And we're aiming for it, and that could be problematic because... They didn't aim for it. They aimed to be hugely, hugely popular. And they managed to get 3% or whatever of people onto their side. Yeah? But, but we're not aiming to be hugely popular. We're aiming to get 3.5%. But that's, very, that's potentially very dangerous. Because if we get 3.5% of people actually on our side and a vast majority who are actively opposed to us, I can promise you we're not going to win. Uh, we're certainly not going to succeed in bringing out system change which is a more radical aim, by the way, which is part of what makes our task so challenging, a more radical aim than the aim that, than those in the Philippines or um, in the civil rights movement or the Indian independence movement. It's more radical than any movement has ever achieved. We're trying to do something which has never been done before, to achieve a kind of total system change, to make our lifestyles as a whole um, ecologically viable. Yeah? So... Very, very risky to think, oh, we only need a tiny percent and it doesn't matter if we alienate other people. That's not how people won in the past. That really isn't how they won. So we need to be thinking about doing actions which the broad ma majority of people think, oh, yeah, well, that makes some sense. I can vibe with that. You know, I'm not sure that I agree with their methods, um, but I can vibe with what they're trying to do and I can s I, their target makes sense to me which was the thing which was so completely absent at, uh, at Canning Town. It's very interesting to watch those videos of the confrontations between the people on the platform there and the, and the rebels there, and the people on the platform saying things like, um, but I agree with you, and uh, um, you know, I travel to work on the tube, and this is an electric uh, train. You know, well, what are you doing? Uh, and the rebels sort of sometimes going, hmm. <laughs> Look. Once again, to be absolutely clear, right, the people who, who did that were utterly, 100% well-intentioned, of course. And, you know, I know some of them personally, and I, and I love them, and they're, and they're brilliant. And we're, we're all just trying to do the right thing, and we're all learning as we go along here, yeah? But I think we cannot go on like this. We cannot go on having um, small actions which bring the whole movement into a very negative light, um, we cannot go on uh, having actions which are perceived um, as targeted against ordinary people. Um, and we cannot go on just trying to get large, larger and larger numbers um, to doing things like blocking roads. We have to get smarter in, in our targeting. That is the pitch I'm making to you here this morning. Now, how ought we to think about this? Does this mean 
that we are uh, moving to the left or something like that? Does this mean that we're becoming anti-capitalist or something, as Sai uh, uh, implied? Um, well, I don't think it does. And let me explain this. This is an absolutely crucial point. If we become identified as a sort of leftist uh, uh, ginger group uh, or something like that, that would be absolutely fatal uh, to us. The thing about XR which is so distinctive is that we are broad-based. We are a response to the climate and ecological uh, emergency. We are an emergency response, right? It's an emergency response when you um, get terrified and decide to get together and do something about it. We are saying that the system has to change, not because of any particular ideology, right? but simply because it has to change, and it will change. Right? Everything is going to change. The only question is, will everything change because we do it intelligently and deliberately and quickly? Or will everything change because that change gets absolutely forced upon us by the brutality of an enraged nature collapsing our existing institutions and structures? <clears throat> The latter is far more probable as if you look at things objectively, but that's what we're trying to stop, right? So everything is going to change anyway, right? The question is, can we bring about that change intelligently? What's driving the whole thing here is necessity, yeah? not ideology. And that is how this idea of being beyond politics is still relevant. I actually think the beyond politics slogan is, is, is is not helpful. It's misleading to say that there's nothing political about what we do. But what's true about it is we're beyond party politics, um, and we're beyond divisive politics, and we're beyond division. We're trying to bring people together and say, look, we've got, we've got to come together to face this absolute emergency. And that we're beyond ideology. Right? So there, are, there have been people for years and years saying, um, look, capitalism is the problem. Uh, we need to challenge the corporations, we need to challenge the banks, we need to challenge the rich, we need to challenge the city. And they haven't really got very far, right? So I'm proposing that we do the same thing, but for different reasons. Yeah? We could use the following idea. We need, to, we, need to, we need to create a kind of consensus, a broad-based consensus among the public that radical change is needed. And that change is necessarily going to lead to, for example, a future in which there are far less, probably none, <laughs> private jet flights. Yeah? Because it's just impossible to have private jets and to have a viable atmosphere and ecosystem. Yeah? There isn't the emission space left for it. Right? But because that argument comes from necessity, because it comes from just pure pragmatics, yeah? then you don't need to be a, a leftist or an anti-capitalist or anything like that to think of it. It's just, it's just common sense. It's just obvious. It's like food rationing in the Second World War, right? Did food rationing in the Second World War get brought in because we had a socialist government? No. It got brought in because it was an absolute necessity. It was a necessity for survival, because it was an emergency. Yeah? Food rationing made Britain a lot more equal as a society. It was, it was great for uh, the, the, the poor and the working class. It led to a lot more um, health, and it was, it was part of how Britain as a whole became incredibly more healthy and more equal during the, the Second World War. But none of that came from socialist ideology. It came from necessity. So we need to produce a consensus. But the way we do that is by working with people who believe in um, anti-capitalism, who believe in the left, etc. This is part of the so-called movement of movements approach but not for the same reason, not as XR, for the same reason that they do. So we could call it an overlapping consensus. So the consensus is on what we need to do, radical system change that needs to challenge the privileges, especially of, of the rich, and needs to challenge the transport methods, especially of the rich and so forth, yeah? But the consensus is on the basis not of our sharing, all sharing of the same ideology, because we don't, right? And that's part of why we say in XR, you don't have to have any particular ideology to be part of XR, and you could be part of any um, political party, within reason, um, uh, with, within XR. So we've got Stanley Johnson, for example, saying that he supports uh, XR. There's a, let you into a little secret, there's apparently a conservative candidate uh, in, uh, in Wales who is, who is uh, of Somali origin, who's coming out and saying he's gonna support the uh, XR3 demands bill uh, in Parliament. You know, great. 
hard to square with his party's manifesto, but great. Um, and so he can be part of the overlapping consensus too. Yeah. So this is again a fundamental aspect of the claim I want to make here this morning. That, that I put forward in my, um, in my pamphlet, Truth and Its Consequences, and in the recent document that just got sent around, um, an argument to the effect that we need to step away from doing things like uh, targeting um, th things that are perceived as targeting ordinary, ordinary people, for example, um, public transport. We need to step away from that and step towards deliberately targeting the, those, the polluter elite, targeting the rich, targeting the, targeting the powerful. That we ought to do that in a self-conscious and deliberate way. We ought to manifest that in our actions. We ought to be doing actions like, well, here in Sheffield, for example, you might imagine doing something like shutting down the, the HSB, HSBC uh, headquarters, something like that. I don't know, but that's one possibility that occurs to me as, a, as an outsider, um, rather than swarming in the, uh, in the streets. But that we do all of that not out of any ideological commitment. We are beyond ideology. We target the same people that, were, that have been targeted for years um, by anti-capitalist protesters and so on, but for a different set of reasons. So we achieve consensus uh, within the movement of movements and a broad consensus across the public, potentially, but that consensus is an overlapping one. You don't have to have the same underlying reasons for, for believing it. And for us as XR, this might not be your view as an individual, you know, you might be a, a card-carrying member of whatever, you know, um, the, the uh, Socialist Workers' Party, for that matter. Um, hope not, but anyway, you might be. Uh, um, whatever your personal reasons for doing it, the reason for doing it as XR is because it's essential, it's because it's necessary, it's because it's just, it's just sheer common sense in the face of an emergency, in the same way that food rationing was common sense in the Second World War. And also, and this is crucial too, if we do it as XR, we won't do it in the same way it's sometimes been done in the past by anti-capitalist protesters or by the black bloc. We won't do it through class hatred, right? We won't do it by saying, you capitalists, you're bad people, right? No, we'll do it without naming, shaming and blaming. We'll do it lovingly. We'll do it attempting to call those people in and say, look, we want you to be part of this consensus too. Become part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And you have children too, like we say to the, to the police as well. You have children too, right? We're all just human beings. Let's act like it, yeah? So the way we do it will be very, very different from the way it's been done uh, in the past. And that's, again, part of the essential thing I want to say, suggest to you here this morning. So I was delighted when I read the, the feedback from the Sheffield debrief to see that many of you have been thinking along similar lines and that your number one bolded uh, bullet point was apparently, yeah, let's do something which is targeted much more at finance, uh, at the rich, at the, at the corporate media, et cetera. Uh, I'm delighted to see you thinking that, and you're not alone. Lots of rebels around the country are thinking in the same way. So one practical point I would say to you is, do make sure that you um, feed that back to uh, National, X, next, National XR to the relevant national circles, also to the, to the region. Um, make sure that your voice gets listened to. And I think we can elaborate on that point by saying, I do think there's a danger that right now in XR, we've become a mass movement, but we're still not really acting like one. We're, we're still acting in a way which has um, possibly a, a little bit of a bias towards um, the positions of the co-founders, and possibly a little bit of a metropolitan uh, bias. And uh, I'm hearing some chuckles around the room, which suggests that maybe that's, uh, that remark has resonated. Um, I wonder how many of you in the room are Game of Thrones fans. Have you got any Game of Thrones, Thrones fans in the house? Yeah, we've got some. Yeah, good. Um, I think it's first class um, um, political um, television and, and writing. Uh, no, really, I do. Um, lots of lessons to be learned from it. Um, you may be uh, aware, even if you're not um, Game of Thrones fans, of the, of the Stark family at the centre of the Game of uh, Thrones. The Stark family who are based in the north. Um, and, uh, and they have this conflict with the, uh, with the, the metropolitan uh, figures in the, in the south of the country who've traditionally had the, had the power and the, and the whip hand. Um, and at one point, uh, a couple of series in, uh, the Stark family declare a sort of UDI and say, we're not going to try to assume right now the throne in, in the equivalent of London in the Game of Thrones world. Um, we're going to declare instead the Kingdom of the North. 
uh, and they declare the, uh, the, the, um, the, the leading um, male Stark heir, the King of the North. Um, well, I'd like to, I'd like to see um, more sort of um, uh, self-belief and autonomous action from, uh, from XR in the North. I think that'd be a good thing. Uh, and, and I'm absolutely serious, serious here. Um, one reason for this is because the future is going to be more decentralized, and we have to start prefiguring that. It's going to, again, definitely be more decentralized, like it or not. Uh, decentralization, localization is coming either through our intelligent, deliberate, rapid action or through it being forced upon us by a collapse, because when society collapses, it obviously relocalizes to a large extent. So that's one reason for, for that. But uh, another reason is simply that I think that um, we need to find ways of acting um, where we are to build the movement. Uh, and we need to acknowledge that there is, um, there, is, uh, uh, there is power and there is stuff that needs challenging, um, not just uh, in London, but, uh, but everywhere. So you know, uh, HSBC and um, your um, city region offices and a, a load of other things um, uh, in this area. I think that we have to build the movement until we maybe, well, until we either get our demands uh, accepted or until we become so huge that we can do what is imagined by those who, uh, who think of the 3.5% figure, which is that we simply overwhelm the authorities in the, in the capital city. But until we reach that point, and we are a long way from that point, we need to build the movement, we need to build popularity, we need to have targets that make sense to people, we need to not alienate people needlessly. Yeah? And let's act intelligently on the, on the ground here. So I'll finish off in a second um, and we can discuss this. But I want to make one more suggestion uh, about the kinds of targets in that context that might make uh, sense. Um, as you'll have heard very clearly, uh, I believe that we uh, ought to be targeting what I call the power behind power. Um, so not just um, the uh, 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 government and local government, although they're important. And you know, I think you should consider um, um, uh, taking actions like we have uh, where I'm from in, uh, in Norwich, um, such as occupying uh, council chambers and stuff like that. Um, but the power behind the power, um, the, the wealth and the, the market power, etc., which drives um, a great deal of what happens in our world and which is incompatible with that world continuing much longer. And that we ought to do that as XR, not for reasons that are ideological or in any kind of capital P sense uh, political, but we ought to do it out of necessity. But that this will be most powerful if we do that in a way which um, makes sense to people because it connects with our vulnerabilities as human beings and our vulnerabilities at this time in history. What do I have in mind? Well, as you may have seen, for example, if you saw me on Question Time representing XR last month, um, I think it's, it's really, really crucial to get people to understand that this is not a crisis which is about 2050 or 2100. It's not just about rising sea levels, terrifying though, though that is. It's not about polar bears. It's not even about our children. It's about what's happening now and really soon um, because we are moving into unknown climatic and ecological territory right now in ways that are um, terrifying. Uh, and they're terrifying because of things like floods, they're terrifying because the, the floods and the wet conditions we've got at the moment due to climate chaos mean that farmers are not able to plant winter wheat and that vegetables are rotting in the fields and so on and so forth. And this is terrifying because we live in a country which is unable to, uh, to feed itself um, at the best of times. And we think we can, we'll always be able to trade and buy food from the rest of the world, but we won't if the same thing starts happening in other parts of the world. So we are really quite vulnerable in a country like Britain. You know, we, we're accustomed to thinking of countries like um, uh, Bangladesh and the small island states and certain African and Middle Eastern countries as far more vulnerable than us. In a way, that's true. And those countries are feeling terrible impacts that we're not feeling right now. But do not assume that we're not going to feel somewhat similar impacts within 10 years or five years or a year. You know, for all we know, this current flooding and wet conditions is the start of a new normal. And Britain is going to have to get used to uh, a, a far more difficult situation food-wise and water-wise um, in the coming uh, years. We are not invulnerable. In fact, we are becoming more and more vulnerable and exposed to harm. And what I would love us to do is to think about doing super intelligent actions that bring that, make that vividly present to, um, to ordinary people in this country. Because that's the way I think we make this more immediate, and that's the way I think that we 
that we win. And again, it's got nothing to do with ideology. Right? You, just, you just do things like you say, we're dependent upon this just-in-time system of supermarket delivery and world delivery of, of food and so on and so forth. This system is super vulnerable. This is, really doesn't make sense uh, in the era that we are living in. We need to tackle the causes of dangerous climate change and we need to adapt to the situation that we're in by relocalizing our food, su food supply, drastically reducing uh, food waste, living lower on the food chain, etc. So what kind of actions could you take to draw attention to this? So you could do hardcore actions or fluffy actions, spiky actions or fluffy actions uh, at supermarket distribution centers, for example. Right? Imagine blocking a, 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 a supermarket distribution center and suddenly, within a day or two, shelves in Tesco are, are clearing out. Because that's, this whole thing is this absolutely fragile, vulnerable, just-in-time system which makes us vulnerable, right? And that's targeting a large corporation <clears throat> in a way that draws attention to the way that we, as a population, are being made super vulnerable by avoidable actions from the powers that be, from the power uh, behind power, um, and bringing that uh, home to people in a way that could make sense to people. So that's one example of the kind of thing I think we could do that would be, A, in a non-ideological way targeted against the, the, the right target, and B, done so in a way that feeds into a narrative that XR is going to be pushing more and more over the coming year of our vulnerability and our, to some extent, unnecessary vulnerability, to some extent, avoidable a vulnerability, a sense in which we're all in this together, a sense in which this is an immediate problem, not a problem about the distant future. Um, and something that if we were to, to apply pressure to, to show what would happen, right, if there was some real food crisis which may be coming uh, in this country, to kind of model that briefly, yeah. We could do that, we could do something in a way there that would, be, that would make immense sense to people and would be like a sort of early warning system. Um, yeah, which maybe could make the difference in waking people up uh, in time. So I hope those, um, those thoughts are uh, conducive or at least interesting. Uh, let's have a discussion about them. Thank you once again so much for being here for this. So uh, thanks, Rupert. Um, <coughs> so if we move on to the questions and answers, uh, and also let's not direct everything at Rupert, um, but it's that what he's just brought up there is surely going to stimulate a lot of debate. Um, it's really hard to see people from here, so can you put your hands up really high and then I'll be able to spot you. Um, yeah. Well, I will just uh, target this at Rupert to start with. Uh, thank you very much. It's very, um, uh, um, lots of things to think about there. I wanted to ask you about media strategy because you have been a media spokesperson. And in fact, I was so impressed by when you spoke in July on today and got a nine minute interview, I actually transcribed it because I thought it did, it was so sort of shocking in a way because you managed in a very competitive situation to actually sort of go towards the all the things you've mentioned about um, when you were challenged about are you against democracy? No, I believe in real democracy. Um, and you managed to make the point about common sense. Now, incidentally, I thought the one question you did fudge was on capitalism. Are you against capitalism? I thought you fudged that, and that was a wonderful opportunity to say some of the awfulness about capitalism. Because you, you did manage to appeal to the audience over the heads of what it was, John Humphreys. Um, but the other question, if that uh, interview I la later realised was in the context of policy exchange, having produced a report about XR, which, which really sort of said, you're terrorists, or, or there's sort of these naive people who go on the streets, but behind that is a, a terrorist organisation run by sinister people, was really the implication. And uh, although you weren't directly tackled about that, I think that is another problem that is going to perhaps become more, um, particularly because broadcasting is into balance and so we have to have 
the policy exchange and Rupert Reid, who you were actually replying to that. So I'd like you perhaps to say something in the context of what you've already said about um, media strategy. Mm, yeah, great, thank you. Did you send me that transcript? Yes, I will. Yeah. I will. You, you, right, so you I will, think, yeah, great. I think a lot of people could learn from it. I don't okay. want to sort of um, make you feel all modest, but I do think that was a, an outstanding interview. And I did wonder whether only someone who's been an academic and has all that cultural capital could have done that. But it then occurred to me that there were enough persuasive strategies there that could be used by anyone. Mm. And also it didn't depend on scientific fact all the time, which I mm. think worries people about, I couldn't represent XR because I'd have to know all mm. the facts or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that, that last point is, is very helpful. Um, what you really need in order to be able to represent XR is yourself. That's it. Um, just tell the truth, be yourself. Uh, I've, I'm quite, yeah, you know, I'm a bright guy and I've got quite a lot of media experience. Um, but I feel that the work I've done with XR over the last year has been completely another level from the work I've done before. Um, and the reason for that is because I've been able to tap in to my own kind of authenticity and the authenticity of the situation in a way I think gives my words a power they've never had before. Um, so, and, and that's, I think, the, the, that's, I think the, if you will, if I, if, I, if I know what the secret of my success is as a media spokesperson, I really think that's what it is. That, that, that in XR now, I've found, I've found a niche where I, can, where, I can, where, I can, where I can tell the truth and be radically uh, uh, disruptive in a way that really, really resonates with people. Uh, so another thing I'm quite proud of in that interview is the way that I turned the tables on Humphreys and started asking him questions rather than him asking me questions. Uh, which is, I think, you know, that, that kind of disruption, that kind of radical truth-telling and challenging the media to do the truth-telling that they're not doing is a crucial part of what we're doing. Now, on the question about anti-capitalism, so you say I fudged that, that, uh, that question. Well, if I did fudge it, I fudged it deliberately, and I did so for the reason that I gave in this talk, right? Because I think it would be a, a real mistake. If I, had, if I had answered that question saying, yes, we're anti-capitalists, um, then he would have. Then he would have been. He would have had me in a sort of silo. He would have had me in a in a in a box, and an awful lot of listeners would have been turned off. Now you might say, yes, but but you should you should tell the truth if we are anti-capitalism. But my response is to say, but the truth is that as XR, we are not ideologically anti-capitalist. What I think is is a lot of what we think will end up coinciding with what anti-capitalists think. Right? But that's the distinction I'm trying to make, that the overlapping consensus between us and others in the, in the movement of movements means that we don't have to have an ideology to come up with similar conclusions. The other crucial point, of course, which I think I made in the interview, is that, is that part of the way we express this being beyond ideology is through the crucial democratic innovation of the Citizens' Assembly. And we say, we're not saying that we've, we've got all the answers. We want to really trust the people to come up with uh, the right answers. And again, that's a very different spirit from the, from the, <coughs> from the traditional spirit of sort of uh, leftist ideology and, and propaganda, where, um, where Marxists, for example, typically very much think, yeah, we have all the answers, <laughs> right? Uh, we're, we're making a, a radically democratic move and putting that back over to the people. Um, now, uh, last point, um, in terms of how to avoid the giving the impression that we are terrorists, Okay, important. <laughs> right, two things. Firstly, we do that by maintaining absolute nonviolent discipline. And I think with one or two teeny exceptions, we've been brilliant at that for over a year now. And that is absolutely essential to, uh, to our success. But the second point is the point that uh, is, again, the point I've been trying to make central to my remarks uh, this morning. That, that if we target the, the rich and powerful and if we try to shut down uh, London City Airport and HSBC HQ and whatever, right? We don't do it because we are extremists or have an extremist ideology. We do it because it's just obvious that this kind of thing needs to happen. And, you know, and I think that more and more people understand that, including people who, you know, who might be quite surprising, including people who, who don't vote Labour or Green or, or whatever. An awful lot of people now understand that we are living in a way that we can't go on uh, like this. Um, that, that, that we're living in a very divided society 
uh, and that the amount of, uh, of wealth and profligacy and pollution that comes from the upper echelons of that society just, uh, just isn't tenable. Um, I think there's, a, there's an open door here waiting for us to, to go through. And we can go through it if we do radical things, if we, if we, uh, if we um, uh, hit provocative uh, targets, etc. But if we do it in a non-ideological spirit, if we do it in a loving spirit, if we do it in a way which is compatible with building this broad-based overlapping consensus, I really think that this is how we win. Okay, so uh, whilst we're still speaking there, a lot of hands have gone up. Um, I'm going to take a number of points all at one, uh, at one time now, and it's the person who's got the microphone can then pass it on to the next person, so starting with Jemima, isn't it? Yeah, start with Jemima, and then pass it to Peter. Yeah. So, so, th so the first point there, right, is that if you target a supermarket distribution center, then initially you are targeting a corporation, right? And, it, and, and the immediate, you don't have any immediate effect on the on ordinary members of the public. Now, if it really works, then after a while you do start to have an effect. You do start to see some shelves uh, uh, emptying, uh, e etc. Uh, and you know, we, we would want it to really work, right? Well, ideally, what you what you're thinking about here is. Um, a thousand people or something turning up, and several hundred of those being uh, being arrestable, and really intelligent ways of blockading, and people might be, you know, gluing onto trucks and stuff like this, right? So if it really works, um, it's going to um, it's going to start to have an effect, but it won't have the effect that people will starve, right? It won't even have the effect that people will be malnourished, right? The effect it will have is that um, for a day or let's dream big for a week, right? Um, you won't have a choice of whether you have uh, pasta or rice or something like that, right? Um, so you'll get some shelves emptying, yeah, because the just-in-time system will start, to, will start to fail. But you won't have uh, uh, riots in the streets. You won't have people starving. Um, so I think it's entirely possible, if this is intelligently messaged, to really keep the public on side. And the centerpiece of the message is, what we are doing here is we're showing you, through targeting this corporation, that in connivance with the government is setting up this really deadly dangerous situation. We're showing you, we're giving you a little bit of a sense of what the future is going to be like, yeah, if we don't change direction. What the future is going to be like is shelves are going to start emptying and then suddenly there'll be, there'll be whole aisles empty or whole supermarkets shut or, you know, people, people starting to become malnourished or people starting to starve and so on. I think if you, if you do this in a smart, non-violent way, with intelligent messaging, there'll be, you'll have no problems compared to the kind of problems uh, that you have from people you know, being um, uh, stuck in traffic, unable to get to their, their father's funeral, or um, being unable to get onto a, a, a train with, because it's got rebels on the top of it or stuff like that. So, uh, thank you, Rupert. It's interesting you talk about um, messaging there, because in terms of the politics side of Extinction Rebellion, the first paragraph on the website of Extinction Rebellion, where it lists the three demands, says Extinction Rebellion is an international apolitical network. Now, this is rather confusing for people, I would say. I've had a lot of conversation with, with people saying, well, Extinction Rebellion is not political. Why are we focusing on an election, for example? Apolitical means no interest in politics. It doesn't mean no interest in party politics. So, yeah. you know, terminology is really important. Yeah. I think, although one of the great things about Extinction Rebellion is the lack of leaders, you know, we are all XR, we are all crew. But messaging is incredibly important. Yeah, totally. Look, this is why I said that I think that the, the slogan beyond politics is actually misleading. Um, the truth of that slogan is beyond party politics. 
uh, beyond uh, divisive politics, beyond ideology. Um, but yeah, I think that the phrase apolitical should probably be, uh, be, be, uh, be bracketed. Yeah. So I'm going to take Naomi and then James and then B. Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. Um, uh, I think, and I, I believe that some other people in the room think, that we are in danger uh, of, of, of having, uh, at the very least, too absolutist an interpretation of, of Principle 10, the principle of autonomous action. Um, I think that, uh, again, you know, to, to say very clearly, because obviously there are people in the room who, who were involved, um, the, the, the tube action, um, superbly um, uh, well-intentioned um, and no problem with, with any of that, but a very real problem with the very predictable um, results that it had, especially um, given the, the, the timing um, of it. Um, I think it's wrong for a very small number of people who were opposed by the vast majority of people in the movement, and that's clear from the poll, that was clear from the People's Assembly, that was clear from, from all sorts of feedback. I think it's wrong that a very small number of people are able to say, uh, we're doing this action uh, as XR, and get supported by national XR media and messaging, um, uh, when the overwhelming majority of the people in the movement don't want it to go ahead. Now, I don't think that's, that's you know, excessive centralization. I think that's just sort of basic sort of um, um, something like democracy, really. Um, and, and again, I think we can't go on like this, and I think that's widely understood, uh, and some changes have already been made. So there's been um, an actions council created. So the idea of the actions council is if you've got very, very uh, controversial actions, <clears throat> then they'll have to pass through that, that council before being approved. They can't simply be done purely um, uh, autonomously. I think that's, that's necessary. Otherwise, we get the movement being, frankly, tarnished. Um, and I think it, that is what happens um, at the end of the October rebellion, that, that a widespread public perception became, oh, you're the people who tried to stop public transport, when most of us didn't want that to, ha to happen. So, yeah. It's obviously a, a challenging issue, but I think that, that there, there, are, there have to be some kind of limits to um, the freedom of autonomous action in a mass movement which is trying to, to do something uh, uh, together as a movement. Who was the next question? James, who's the next guy? Yeah. Hi, uh, James. Um, I've been involved with some XR actions. Uh, Will I tell the audience before I ask the question that I have this year trained up to be a Greenpeace activist and I look forward to being yeah. uh, called up to some of their actions. Um, I agree XR probably needs to change its approach. My concern though is the direction of travel of, your, of the actions that you propose uh, become very Greenpeace-esque. And Greenpeace has been trying to do this for many decades why is XR going to succeed where Greenpeace didn't succeed <coughs> as much as it had hoped? Okay, so let me briefly respond to that because it's a very important question. So I hope that some of what the reasons for that were implicit in what, in what I said already, but let me bring it out. First difference, uh, mass nonviolent direct action. Not really employed by, by, by Greenpeace. Like I just said, um, let's have a thousand people to do it, say shutting down a supermarket distribution center. Greenpeace typically tries to do things with five, 10, 50, maybe you know, 70, something like that, people at the most, not, not thousands. So that's one really important difference. Uh, second difference, always coming back to being motivated by, uh, by, uh, by love, um, always coming back to um, an avoidance of naming, shaming, and blaming. Um, 
you know, Greenpeace is, uh, is obviously a wonderful organization, which you know, I'm, I'm an active supporter of and so on. Um, but I don't think that that can be truly said to be the way that Greenpeace has <coughs> tended to uh, angle itself. Uh, Greenpeace has tended to say, uh, here are the villains, we're going to do stuff against them. Right? This is the really, this is the really sort of mind flip of the approach that I'm taking and the, the basis for this overlapping consensus where we, ha we, we might be targeting exactly the same people um, as traditional anti-capitalists or black bloc even or whoever, right? But in a very different way and for very different reasons, right? The mind flip is to think, I'm trying to stop these, uh, these, these private jets, I'm trying to shut down this, uh, this bank, whatever it is, right? Not because of class hatred, not because I think these think people are bad, not because of an ideology, but simply because it's common sense. Simply because everybody, including them, right, at some level know that this is necessary. And actually, you know, that is the truth. If you talk to people for in the insurance industry or the banking industry, for example, yeah, a lot of them know, it's, uh, and they'll tell you, that what they're doing is, is wrong and it can't go on. They just don't know how to, how to carry on with, well, you know, whatever, feeding their children, or they don't know how to change the, the system from within. And they'll often say to us, you know, keep doing what you're doing. We need you to try to, to make it more likely that we get to change. So I'd say, I'd say the, 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 the methods that we use, in, in particular the scale of it, the, the, the narrative, uh, the basis in, in, in love and beyond ideology, I think those things are quite different from the context in which Greenpeace has approached, approached those things. But I'd welcome further debate on that. So I'm just going to take a quick temperature check because we've got so many hands down. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, I've got Bing and I've got someone at the back who I can't see, but you know who you are. Uh, and then Heather. Now we were supposed <coughs> to be having a break. Do people, people want a break or do we want to continue? Because there are a lot more hands. Carry on. Yeah, so I think the atmosphere so is here. It's, this is really good. So I'd like <laughs> to start now, and then um, I'll pass my turn up to you. Okay, uh, thanks, I'm Ben. Thanks, uh, Rupert, uh, with you on almost everything you said. But just following on from James's point, I think we should remember that we've got most of the way that we have got through being disruptive. Mm. And I don't mm. think that I think we, sh we would be, um, we'd be poorer if we started being frightened about being disruptive. Mm -hmm. but having said that, I take all your, your points that we should be targeting and yeah. messaging really to be really effective. But my second point, the main one, is how do you think we should change uh, in this new media situation where there's so much more coverage and where a lot of people will be saying much more clearly, hey, come on, somebody is sorting this out now. We all do know mm. it's on the telly. Yeah. Even though we know, don't we, that there's been absolutely zero action. Yeah. Um, Sheffield Council have talked to us really nicely, made all sorts of promises, and then defaulted absolutely on every single promise. Mm -hmm. So we're in a new situation now where things appear to be done, but in fact they're not being done. Yeah. Uh, ideas on how to change. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's the old suffragette uh, principle, right? Deeds, not words. Right? We, we have to demand action. We have to keep on, we have to keep on saying, look, they've learned how to talk the talk since XR came along, but you've got to walk the walk. And these kinds of things make sense to, to people, right? People know the difference between action and words. So we have to be really clear and disciplined and heavy about that. And we have to, uh, we have to operate a carrot and stick approach, all completely lovingly, all completely nonviolently, right? So, so, so um, disruption, I mean, absolutely, and I hope that was implicit in everything that I said. You know, I believe in us being disruptive in the, in the media by doing things like turning the tables on interviewers, by getting radically emotional, etc. But I also believe that the, the time is coming when we should be more radically disruptive with the media and where, where um, those media which, have, um, which are responsible for the ongoing non-truth telling um, should be uh, targeted in a more heavy way. I mean things like, um, so if, if I was going on um, Sky with Adam Bolton, for example, I'd be thinking about doing something like um, gluing on to one of their cameras, you know? <laughs> um, uh, and, if, uh, and if I was going on um, uh, so with some um, um, unpleasant host on, uh, on talk radio or LBC in the studio, you know, the same kind of, 
same kind of thing. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of, yeah, and then I, I, th I think I said it with the, with this, with the supermarket distribution center or what have you, right? Yeah, let's let's do kind of mass, uh, hardcore, um, uh, spiky uh, actions um, uh, that that really uh, that really um, challenge things and really put. Um, 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 really throw grit into the workings of the just-in-time um, system. Uh, uh, and if we message that well, it will make sense to people. And we, we are the smoke alarm. We are the early warning system. This is the kind of thing I, I think we have to do. That, that's all I've got, but I think it might be enough. Hi, uh, I'm Mel. Um, back to what you were saying about overlapping consensus. I think it's very interesting. I don't quite understand the difference between ideology and necessity because why are people anti-capitalist if not because they see the necessity and mm. I'm thinking in particular of um, criticisms that have been levelled at XR around inclusivity around it being an overwhelmingly white middle class pursuit and around intersectionality which by which I mean issues of climate justice and if you approach these problems, the criticisms are, unless you've got these problems, unless you start from an understanding of climate justice and the intersectionality, but you're always coming at it as a kind of tacked on issue and you're never gonna, if you shy away from a, a, a political analysis, you're never gonna be effective. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's, that's a great important question. Um, to tackle the first half first, it's a really interesting challenge. I guess the point I would, and it, of course you're quite right, it's quite possible that some so-called anti-capitalists are actually thinking about this in the same kind of way that, that, that I am. It's just a matter of necessity. Um, the, the, way I would, uh, the way I would put it is, uh, is this, um, that, that we don't say um, you need to have a more equal society because equality is a, is a good thing in itself. We say you have to have a more equal society because that's what the emergency demands. Now many of us might believe, and I, also, I do believe, that equality is a good thing in itself. But XR yeah, stands for saying this is a full systemic, uh, 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 um, a full spectrum um, emergency response. And that's how it can be broad-based, and that's how we can get everyone on board. And we're part of a movement of movements with lots of people who think um, uh, equality is a good in itself. And indeed, you know, maybe other people as well who think things like um, um, uh, the rich are evil or something like that. Um, but, um, but, but our motivation is not stuff to do in the first instance with considerations of... Um, um, of, uh, of political philosophy. It's to do with um, what is actually demanded by the situation. So that's how I would uh, respond to the first part of your question. On the second part, we might disagree, and this is a huge, uh, uh, difficult uh, area. Um, I'm not um, particularly impressed by the way that um, so-called intersectionalist ideology uh, has evolved. And it is, I would, I would argue, an ideology itself. So that you know, might fit in with, with, with what I've been trying to say. I think we have to be very cautious before buying into any ideology, as XR. I don't think we should be uh, doing so. I think that the crucial fact about this emergency is that we're all in it together. Now, of course, it's true that some are, are, um, uh, are more on the front lines than others. So, you know people in, in Bangladesh, particularly poor people in Bangladesh, are more on the front line than others. In this country, um, people in communities that are <clears throat> likely to be flooded, people in communities that are more polluted, etc. And those people are, are disproportionately uh, um, poorer people. Um, you know, that's, that's all true. Um, but I think that to take up a kind of a stance that says something like uh, people can only um, uh, start fighting oppression when they fight their own oppression, which is what I understand the intersectionalist um, ideology to say, um, I think is, is, is wrong. 
I think that many of us are in this because we care uh, a great deal about our children and our grandchildren. Many of us are in this because we care a great deal about non-human animals and about nature. Well, that's not about uh, fighting against our own oppression. That's about a kind of a deep set of you know, values and, and, and commitments that we have as human beings. And as human beings, we need to come together uh, around this issue uh, on the basis of a, of a, of a deep, loving um, emergency response. And yeah, it's true that there is something of a bias in our movement towards the middle class, although don't exaggerate it. I know lots of brilliant working class rebels don't erase them. Uh, and yet it's true that there is a bias, and I'm certainly seeing it in, in this room, towards us being uh, white, although again, don't exaggerate it. When I, I really, there was a Guardian article called, with the title something like, when I look at Extinction Rebellion, all I see are white faces. And I thought, what a disgraceful headline, because that just erases all my um, uh, ethnic minority um, colleagues in XR. It erases people like... Um, Skeena Rathor and Kofi, who runs the International Solidarity Network, and loads of other brilliant um, people of color who are active um, uh, in XR. So let's not erase uh, their contributions. So on the one hand, we, we need to be always looking to, and I know that Sheffield, you're very concerned about this, and rightly so, we need to be always looking to how can we involve uh, members of, of the community which are, which are not so involved? Uh, how can we make sure that, for example, we're including prominently um, people of color among our spokespeople, which the media and messaging team really work hard uh, to do. But I would be really cautious about approaching that on the, on the grounds of, a, of an intersectionalist uh, uh, ideology. I think instead our starting point should be emergency response uh, and universalism. Right? If we don't come together and face this as a community, as a nation, as a species, on the basis of what we have in common, that we're all deeply vulnerable to the horrible, unprecedented situation that we're moving in. If we don't come together and face it together in that way, and if we look instead in the first instance of what divides us, I think we may be finished. Right. I'm going to take Heather, and then I'm going to take Sophie, um, the guy there. I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. I couldn't say your name, but I've forgotten it. Um, and then I think we should have Emma... Uh, giving some information about the debris and then finish off with maybe a few questions after that because we're going to run out of time. Right, so we're skipping the break completely, are we? We're skipping the break completely. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Total skip. Right, okay. <laughs> right, so, uh, Heather. No, I'm okay. No, I'll, I'll be all right. Because I can relax now with the next Emma bit. Yeah. <laughs> Have you got a microphone, Heather? Yep, yep. And then seeing with new eyes in our interconnected way, yep. but then to actions. And she, as you know, proposes sort of three zones. One is the holding action, stopping the bad, which yep. we do very well. Consciousness raising. But then the other one is, is putting forward the models of the new. And I do wonder, for all of us, not just our messaging, whether we do need to paint some pictures, not, not policies necessarily, but paint some pictures about what a world would look like with sharing and more equality and clean air um, and, and quite a lot of you know, losses as well. Yes. To paint that picture, because I, I don't think, and I'm a psychologist by background, you can't hold on to just being terrified. Absolutely. Can, we, can I take that one? Because there's a lot there already. Um, look, I, I agree with everything you said, and I think you put it beautifully. Joanna Macy is one of my uh, teachers, and I think she's uh, got profound guidance here. Yeah, despair is not something you get stuck in. Despair is something you move through, but you only move through it if you feel it. You only move through it if you, if you allow yourself to feel it. 
usually with uh, in a process that involves other people. Um, and so uh, if, I, if I made it sound as though I wanted people to be terrified all the time, that was a mistake. What I meant is something like, um, if you're not sometimes terrified, then you're not paying attention. Uh, and these, these emotions come uh, and they go. Uh, and we need to, to try to make sure, especially when we're sort of on parade publicly, uh, that we don't suppress them. And I think it, it, it would be a splendid, one of, the, one of the moments that I'm most proud of in, in my own um, recent media stuff with XR is when I was on BBC Politics Live uh, and, I, um, uh, and I, I drew on my, um, wrote on my arm the names of my nieces and then revealed that to the camera and said, this, this is who I'm doing it for. And I sort of, I choked up a bit at that moment and you could just about see that. You could hear that, you know, there was a kind of catch uh, in, my, in my words and, you know, that was just completely... Genuine. I couldn't even think straight for the next half a minute, which is quite challenging when you're on live uh, TV. Uh, and as a result, you know, things, stuff just sort of, sort of started coming out. And actually, the remainder of that interview, I thought, was, was, was more emo emotionally authentic than almost anything else I've done. And including, I got sort of quite sort of excited about the, the nonsense that the other panelists were saying. And I remember at one point saying something which is, you know, verging on the edge of kind of being non-XR when, when one, of the, uh, one of the other panelists said something kind of... Um, um, about um, growth or something, and I said, that's just trash. Uh, <laughs> but actually, I think it was good, you know, it was, it was just, pff, I was just cutting through and saying, no, sorry, we just can't have that kind of talk uh, uh, anymore. So yeah, let's, let's, let's not get stuck in any of these things. Let's work through them and go through them, but you only go through them uh, if you feel them. Now, in terms of painting the positive picture, I totally agree. I think we need more of that. I've argued for some time that we badly need more art that does this, that we need TV programs, um, uh, music, uh, any kind of narrative art that shows us more about the future and how we could get there. I think, I think artists, especially on TV, have completely let us down on this so far, and I hope that that's going to, uh, going to change. I would add one thing to, to Joanna Macy's categorization. I don't think the threefold categorization is enough. I think it, it leaves out part of what XR does, or at least aims to do, which is not just holding actions, but a, an attempt to actually transform the system and transform the, the, the polity. Uh, in other words, I think there's a certain sense in which Joanna uh, is not ambitious enough. And XR is trying to be incredibly ambitious. If we get our three demands brought in, it'll be partly about the new vision that you talk about, but it'll be partly about just kind of basic but really kind of hugely powerful things like um, taking most uh, petrol vehicles off the road fairly quickly, replacing them with uh, some of them with electric uh, pool cars, radically relocalizing so society, et cetera, et cetera. There's going to be the Citizens' Assembly, if we get to that point, right, the National Citizens' Assembly. Will will be be putting forward. We hope we we need it to be doing so. Huge swinging changes which go beyond uh, uh, holding actions. That sort of almost revolutionary vision is, I think, a fourth element that needs to be added to her typology. Yes. With compassion for all, and that means we are distressed by what's happening in Bangladesh or, or whatever. Oh yes. And that's why we're calling for climate justice. That's why we're calling for a more equal society. So, I, I, and I haven't. I love to see that more in our literature, in our leaflets. That um, these are, you know, this is why this is, you know, wanting climate justice. Not just necessity. Sure, sure, sure. A absolutely. But that was, that's the point about love, right? That's where I think it all comes from, love and care. And that's, that's integral to our nature as mammals and as primates and as humans. So the case I'm trying to make is that, the, that, um, that all this comes from necessity, given that we love, given that we care. If we didn't, if we didn't love, then there would be no necessity. It'd be just like, all right, so we're going to die out. We're going to go extinct, whatever, you know, things happen. Right, so it comes from that, and the point the point I'm making is that um, is that it's it's that it's that love and that deeply sort of caring uh, nature.
that I think needs to be mobilized and can be emotionally uh, mobilized, right? Um, and not the sort of, uh, uh, if you will, kind of sort of colder, more rational uh, realm of, uh, of ideology or of uh, sets of um, um, specific political ideas that hang together, which is what kind of an ideology is. So that's the claim that I'm making, that the, the necessity in the context of emergency um, happens on the basis of, of love uh, and not on the basis of one controversial ideology rather than another. And I think love is something that can, uh, that can unite us. If it doesn't, then I don't think anything will. I think that love can unite us because it comes from our nature as mammals, as primates, as human beings. Does that make sense? Yeah, I agree with you. I think we should be bolder at, at expressing more of that uh, in, in, in public uh, as well. You have to be a little bit careful. British people are sometimes a little bit kind of cautious about words like love. But <laughs> finding ways of kind of getting that to, to make sense to people. You know, you can start, uh, an easy way in, of course, is through the absolutely crucial thing of we all love our children. We all care for our children more than anything else. So what does that really mean? Well, here's what it means. Yeah, really nice question. Really, really important. Um, yeah, I'm very sympathetic with what you're saying. There's a really interesting old uh, paper which um, people may want to look at, which talks about this. It's called the tyranny of structurelessness. Uh, and what it, uh, so you kind of get the idea from the title. It, it argues that sort of flat structures and kind of uh, anarchist structures claim not to be structures at all. But they are, and what they tend to empower is, well, there's various things that they tend to empower. You've mentioned some of them. One of the things they sometimes empower is simply like people with loud voices as well. Um, so yeah, this is a problem. Uh, and uh, I think one form that the problem sometimes takes uh, in XR is a kind of uh, privilege for the, for the co-founders and a sort of uh, kind of attitude of sort of slightly kind of charismatic adoration for the co-founders, which sometimes one might argue enables um, some of the co-founders, or one especially of the co-founders, to, to get away with uh, uh, things that perhaps shouldn't be uh, got away with. Um, I think we should be aware of that. We talk about mitigating for power, but do we mitigate for that kind of power? I'm not, I'm not convinced that we do. What do we do, uh, what do, we do about this? How do we handle this? Um, so one thing we, we need to do is build a better feedback structure. We really badly need to do that, and that, that's being attempted uh, at the moment. Until that happens, I go back to what I said before. I encourage you to, uh, to, to make, uh, make a noise uh, yourselves and say, hey, we're not happy with, um, with there being a bit of a metropolitan uh, bias. We want to make sure that grassroots rebels get taken seriously. I think you're right that the, the national structure of XR is somewhat um, uh, opaque. Um, one thing which has been suggested is an XR Congress. Um, I think there, is, there, there are some good grounds for thinking that that could be helpful. A way that we could all kind of come together uh, and, and, and have a way of speaking uh, 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 together which would kind of um, get beyond some of the power which is entrenched in the, in the national um, circles. I don't have a, a, a total solution to this, but I think that those are some ideas which could help. And I think you're basically right. I think something needs to change. We are a mass movement now, but we sometimes don't, uh, don't act like it. I'd welcome other thoughts on what we could, uh, what we could do to change this.
first actual proper action, and I absolutely loved it, and I think about it constantly. Yeah. Um, I recognise uh, an XR person from the front row there, and um, while we were there on the outside of the airport, he was doing uh, using the mic check way of, uh, of giving us information, and I learned so much there. <coughs> That's where I first learned about the uh, what is it, twenty percent of the population that fly and. That's a worldwide figure. Sorry? That's a worldwide okay. figure. Okay. I'm gonna, some of the stuff I say might not be complete, but I'm sure people will. Mm. Uh, and there was also something about, I think it was Leeds City Council that had passed a climate emergency that allowed Leeds Bradford Airport, Airport to expand mm. and stuff like that. Mm. So that all stuck in my head. But at the same time that my colleague was saying that, there were two guys on the roof of the airport. And it just occurred to me that those kinds of education um, tidbits would have been great if those guys at the top were, were giving that information mm. wider. Having said that, they got up there through barbed wire and cut themselves. <laughs> so I guess they had other things on their mind. Yeah. So we're getting positions of action to educate the people listening, the police and everybody is, is great. Also at that action, there was a guy, uh, a, uh, he's a doctor, um, he was saying that his mum is from Uganda and he was saying that it hurt his heart that he probably wouldn't ever fly again to take his mum to her homeland. And that resonated with me because my mum is from Barbados, my dad works for British Airways, so we grew up with fairly frequent flights to yeah. Barbados, okay? And I've always considered it my right to be able to go there and see family. And it suddenly hit me, oh my God, I could make this pledge never to go to Barbados again. However, I know that that economy is built on tourism, okay? So yeah. that's a little bit of a dilemma for me. Yes, I don't want to fly, but B, my family in Barbados uh, live on the tourism aspect. Yeah. So it's kind of not a question to you as such, it's more my rumination to that <laughs> action that's happened it's since then. Yeah, lo lovely. Look, I'll just quickly say, um, that the, the, the way I think we should think about the question of climate justice primarily is in relation to questions like what you raised. Uh, in other words, yes, if there's going to be a lot less flying, by the way, you don't necessarily have to never go to Barbados again. You could do a Greta and go by boat. Um, but uh, if we're going to have a lot less international tourism, then yeah, absolutely. We need to get serious about finding ways of, uh, of bringing about justice that don't involve the kind of absolutely crude instrument of mass international um, climate and ecosystem devastating tourism. So what would that look like? Well, you know, ultimately that would be hopefully for citizens' assemblies to, to decide um, uh, on a national and international, I would say, basis. But it would be things like a free technology transfer, maybe debt for nature swaps. Free technology tra transfer, well, basically what it boils down to is what we ought to do is give away um, lots of green tech to countries like Barbados. So rather than them getting money through the sort of trickle-down method of us flying over there and destroying the world and, and spending money there, we simply give them uh, what they need in order to uh, build a, a greener society and, uh, and be, less, uh, be less poor. It's stuff like that. You know, there are solutions that don't involve mass international tourism.
Yeah, look, I, I totally agree. Um, if you read the uh, the document that uh, that Sai has sent round to you all and that will be sent round again, um, I do talk about some of this, um, but obviously it's a much bigger process. And what you're trying to do is draw the distinction between tactics and strategy, I think, right? So it's not enough to have a sort of a sort of make a sort of tactically clever move. You need to embed it within a broader strategic approach. And I would say what that strategy should be a lot about is about building the movement so we become bigger and bigger and maybe eventually get to be able to simply shut down a capital city and demand change if that's what it takes. Um, building a, a movement by doing, um, by doing actions that, that build on each other uh, and that are as, mu as much as possible win-win-wins in the sense that they are actions which, um, which are symbolically uh, effective and actually substantively effective. They actually make a difference by doing things like creating a pinch point in just-in-time systems that are not directed uh, at ordinary uh, people, um, but uh, rather at the, at the rich and powerful, uh, and that expose the vulnerabilities in the system which we are all ultimately um, susceptible to. And if we do those kind of um, kinds of actions systemically building upon each other, I think we can start to create the sort of consciousness shift uh, uh, that we need, which will have all sorts of results, including uh, basic things like people voting differently uh, in elections, which obviously is important, but also um, much, uh, much bigger things in terms of demanding real change and demanding, well, demanding something like our demands get met, basically. So I'm now going to ask um, Emma to come down and provide <coughs> a bit of feedback from the October Rebellion. I'm really conscious that there's still lots of hands. We could uh, probably have a 10 minute break and then do another two hours, but there's yeah. a good um, But there's so much there which we can be discussing um, into the future. So if Emma uh, comes down and talks now, and uh, then we'll have a little bit more time together, and then we'll have to wrap up. Do you want to, do you, you want to round up as well, Rupert? Well, maybe not. I think we've, we've had enough from yeah, the so questions. Yeah. We, we, we've probably got about another 15 minutes, and then we need to go to Port students because they're doing great stuff out on town hall set. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's it. Uh, yes, thank you very much uh, for that. Sorry about my throat. Um, Join the club. You've actually <laughs> um, done most of what I was asked to do um, for me, because all that discussion brought up a lot of the points. Um, but Sophie, uh, who I don't think could be here, um, and I were asked to just feedback on the kind of debriefs that we'd had as a local group, and some of the main points that came up there, and our thoughts about how they can be used going forward. Um, so just to, to talk about how we did that, so in the three weeks or so after the October Rebellion, um, we met um, at some kind of more uh, emotional, reflective kind of debrief sessions, um, and then also some revolving specifically around the practicalities of what we thought we could change, um, look, both looking at what we could do as a local group amongst ourselves to prepare ourselves um, with what, after what we'd learnt uh, in London, um, but also what we wanted to send down to kind of national XR and what, uh, what might be useful going forward. Um, just so everyone knows, that will be going down to national. We've been sent a big form, <laughs> um, which takes a lot of filling in, um, but just so that we can actually send down all of our points, both reflections on what came up in those sessions, but also our suggestions for how those changes could be imp implemented. So that will be going down to their central feedback system uh, in the near future. Um, a lot of what the key themes were have already been brought up here um, in terms of the um, tension between our, you know, part of what is central to XR being about being, being quite radical, being quite, be, being disruptive going and actually, you know, being a face to the public, catching headlines, having uh, arrests, showing sacrifice, not wanting to lose that core of what it, it began as being, but also uh, a number of people wanting to have some kind of growth, including that, but going further than that. 
and maybe expanding what we do to be to have some more kind of positively engaging actions if we're, if we're targeting the main disruption to the, the, the money, the power, the corporations, uh, the government, then also tying into that, having some more positively engaging uh, actions that do interface with the public, um, whether that be more of an educational kind of basis or just to, to make our points seem relevant to those everyday uh, lives. Um, another point that came up is that maybe we could be slightly more preemptive, and I think you brought this up in terms of being intelligent about how we plan what we're doing going forward. Um, that some of the, as much as you know, National XR and the people who organised the October Rebellion must have had an enormous amount of work and planning go into it. There were a few kind of sticking points that came up afterwards that seemed like they could have been anticipated by, by every one of us, but also about the, by the, um, the main planners, um, whether that be about, you know, uh, how if we, if we keep on doing the same thing, then the police will know what to expect and they will come better equipped um, next time. So whether actually one of the gems that we have in XR is our creativity and our artistry and our ability to do things that people don't expect. Um, mm. Obviously, one of the things that came up a lot was that same question that's already been brought up here, and I think we don't have a, a perfect answer for yet in terms of the tension between autonomy and democracy, and whether we can have a nice mix of both and not losing either of those in our identity, but also realizing that things like the tube action. Um, in, in, in the way it was carried out, not necessarily, you know, the, the intentions behind it or the, the, you know, I know some people within the group uh, agreed with the target that was there, um, but whether that, the, the divisive nature of it, both within XR and in the public, um, would it be better kind of thought through over a longer period of time? And I don't know whether that's what the aim of the Actions Council. You, uh, Actions Council mm. to, to, you know, if, if they're going to do slightly more spiky actions, then have media and messaging out there ready to anticipate the potential backlash and um, that kind of thing. Um, and the other thing uh, that, that mainly came out um, was, again, that, you know, no one quite knows exactly who kind of national XR are, and I appreciate that that's because it's probably an ever-evolving, changing group of people who are just volunteering their time. Um, but that one of the movements potentially to alleviate some of this feeling of everyone just going down to London to follow the commands of Telegram and... Mm. Um, it is, is to, and one of the ways that we could kind of decentralise but still have enough structure that it actually works is um, potentially to give out kind of uh, the, the certain targets, whether that be a certain corporation or banks or two different regional groups, so that I know that London's an easy place for us to gather around, but if, say, Sheffield or XR North took on the actual planning and took ownership of a national action aimed at a certain time uh, and place and focus, whether that would give everyone in the movement a feeling of slightly more ownership over the movement, um, a bit more uh, ability to act, um, and also a little bit more transparency. Um, Can I just start with one, one mm -hmm. quick remark on that? Um, I'm just very struck by the irony, which I think has become apparent in our discussion here. On the one hand, we've got principle 10, which says autonomous action, and some of us think, well, maybe that principle has even gone a bit too far, at least in the way it's been interpreted, with uh, people being able to take autonomous actions, which are very controversial in the name of the whole of XR. But on the other hand, we've got this bizarre way in which we're hyper-centralized, right? I mean, it's really weird if you put those two things together. How come is it that we're supposedly sort of on the one hand, we, we kind of got, we're, we're possibly even leaning too far towards autonomy for, for, for local groups. But on the other hand, most of the time with regard to the big rebellions, it's simply a question of, here's the master plan, now everybody do it. 
You know, it's, it's, it's weird. Some, there's got to be some kind of better balance in between there where there's some kind of, where, where you, you've got kind of, um, where you've got accountability and you've got a sense of we are one movement, but yet you've got some real kind of decentralization happening uh, and, and you don't have this sense of kind of national XR or metropolitan XR sort of calling all the shots. Absolutely. <laughs> Got some jazz hands. Um, I think those were our, our main points. If the, if mm -hmm. I, I don't know whether we have whether we're having time for another couple of discussions on on that basis. I think I was just asked kind of just to feedback to you and for kind of the ba the, the uh, use of anyone who didn't make it to those debrief mm -hmm. sessions that um, they're much along the same kind of lines as in the document that you mentioned. Um, but obviously there are always going to be nuances and that also if anyone has specific kind of light bulb ideas for how we can tackle these things, you can feed that back into us and we will get that down to national. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. So does anyone uh, want to add to the discussion in terms of this place there? Someone at the back. Someone at the back. Can you put your hand up? Right at the very back side, right at the top of the aisle. <coughs> uh, just a mention of educational. So I know recently we've had a lot of this announcement that comes to make it very apparent that they're all the same. Sorry about this. Um, on education, recently the Italian government has made it a part of their plans to roll it out across all year groups. Um, Hannah Persis has already come out about that in this country. Whether you think A, it's feasible, B, it would be impactful, and how that might fit in as well. Um. I, I, sorry, is that directed at, at me or, or just at the room? Or, or, I'm not. Uh, it's it's it? yeah. <laughs> Someone at the front here. Yeah. So you might want to fix it too. <laughs> uh, yeah, we can talk afterwards if you want to follow more specifically, but absolutely that's what a lot of what we're campaigning for in XR educators. Um, I think we're a long way from that, unfortunately. In Italy they've got various, I think partly they've got a bit of political shake up there anyway, and that has had some bad effects, but it's had some good things, and one of the good things is they've uh, had some radical opportunities for change in the curriculum. We've been really pushing for radical change now, and so the, what the Youth Strike Movement are doing, um, mm. there's a big movement called uh, Teach for Future, which is a combination of NUS, the youth strike movement and XR educators, we're supporting that as well. It's, it's really hard work getting specific ed, ed, specific government departments to make specific change. Uh, they really do what central government tell them to do, and they're not. No government department seems to be doing any, anything particularly interesting at the moment because they're so preoccupied with other stuff. But if you want to talk to me afterwards, we can maybe have a bit more. About that. I think it should happen a lot in universities as well. I, mean, I really, as a university teacher myself. I think we need to be transforming our whole curriculum in the light of the emergency. Mm. Um, yeah, I just wanted to follow up from what Emma said about the sort of organising our own actions. I think um, some of the best parts for me of being in London was when we lost our site. Um, it was really difficult to organise. Things were in danger of descending into chaos. And, but then we organised our own group and we organised some of our own actions. So we targeted um, Black Rock. We did uh -huh. some road swarms on the City of London Day. We um, we were outside the Oil and Gas Fiscal Summit. But if we'd have known beforehand that we were going to do that, mm -hmm. we could have done it even better. As it was, mm -hmm. we were scavenging for cardboard mm -hmm. uh, left out on the streets yeah. so we could make our own placards mm -hmm. and organise them very much at the last minute. And it would have been great to have decided that in advance <coughs> and got really well prepared. Yeah, I totally agree. I think you did a great job at BlackRock, though, all the same. So, yeah, that's the kind of thing that's possible. And going back to thinking about what you might do here, um, I think one thing which is which is obvious is that you've got councils here which are saying lots of good things but not doing very much differently. So they are, they are ripe for um, occupation, whatever, like we did in 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 Norfolk. Uh, that's just that's just a sort of open door waiting to be walked through. <laughs> okay, so. Um, 
We've had a really good discussion today and I'm going to call time on this discussion now. And a um, number of housekeeping things just to finish with. Uh, I'm not quite sure how the Eventbrite um, got set up. Well, it got set up because I set it up, but I've never set up an Eventbrite before. <laughs> I kind of under the impression some people maybe paid some money in. Um, I've got no idea where it's gone to, but I'll try and trace <laughs> that because I can't recall having put any credit card details in, but maybe it just knows who I am. Um, so we'll check so on that. you become rich then? I don't know. It's possible. <laughs> um, but if people haven't been, if they didn't book on Eventbrite and um, haven't made uh, any donation, we're asking for donations for the room. We've got a very plush place today, really comfy seats, haven't we? It's not our normal nice. uh, fare, um, but we have had to pay for it. So um, Jeff at the back will be doing a little bit of a shake um, for any money which, if you've not already contributed, if you could put in. Um, secondly, I'd like to say thanks to um, Martin for filming this event and for Theo and Rosie for producing this, uh, doing the sound for us, and also to Jeff for um, helping to organise it. It's been a, a really good event. Um, one other thing to mention before we move off to the town hall is uh, at the main Monday meeting, we... Um, discussed what our response as a group um, would be to um, the, uh, the, the, the uh, comments that Roger made um, to the Zeit magazine and we felt that uh, this needed a whole group response or as many people uh, as possible to be involved in the democracy of response and to see whether we're comfortable with the one that XR nationally have put out or whether we want to change it so that we can own um, our own uh, comments on it. So we decided we're going to have a slight discussion and then a people's assembly um, with in the near future. And thanks to Matt, uh, has provided Union Street for us on Monday after the main Monday meeting, which I think is probably going to be the soonest we can all get together without having to make another trip into Sheffield and without having to find a venue. So if people can bear in mind, when we finish the meeting at 8 o'clock on Monday, uh, if you want to hang around for a people's assembly, we can produce a response mm. which hopefully <coughs> that will uh, be a, a very democratic <coughs> way of, of, um, mm. of, of concluding uh, our, our feelings mm. towards the situation. Uh, so that's it. Um, thanks ever so much, Rupert. It was absolutely brilliant. You've put so much effort into, into speaking today. It's yes. been really good. Can we give a really big... Yeah, great, we'll do that. And, I, yeah, and also, just one other thing, just to mention, Julian has organised another meeting tomorrow, another, which, uh, following on from what uh, Rupert and Heather were talking about with Joanna Macy, uh, Active Hope uh, at the Quakers. Do you want to just yeah. say? <laughs> so, Julian, um, Regen coordinator. <laughs> so, the Regen group is uh, putting on a series of workshops, Active Hope workshops, uh, subtitle, How to Face the Mess We're In Without Going Crazy. Uh, so these are based on Joanna Macy's work. Um, her cycle is gratitude, pain for the world, reframing all that, and then next steps. Well, we're running a workshop tomorrow on the first of those, gratitude. 9.45 to 1 at Victoria Centre, Stafford Street. Details on the XR Facebook page, and please book on Eventbrite there. No money to be paid to a vet <laughs> That's the way to do it. All right. Okay. So thank you very much, Rupert. Oh, thank you.